right, guys, moving on to our second lecture now on fat metabolism. Just recalling what our four lectures are going to be about. Our first lecture was talking about how we actually get dietary fats into um, our cells to even consider metabolizing them. We kind of briefly talked about how we might consider those from endogenous sources, and we'll deal more with that in our last section. So that was our first lecture. We're going to talk about fatty acid uh, metabolism right now uh, in this lecture. So what do we do with acetyl-CoA? And again, it doesn't matter at this point um, necessarily where we get acetyl-CoA from. It's always going to go through the citric acid cycle, but we're going to see how we get that acetyl-CoA right now from fats. Uh, we'll also talk about, okay, if you've got acetyl-CoA, um, we can't export that out of the cells and fatty acids can't be imported into the brain. So what if you're low in blood sugar? Your brain needs to function. So we create something called ketone bodies for that. So we'll talk about that. So ketone bodies are an important metabolite when we're low on glucose in our body. Fourth, uh, third and fourth lectures deal with fatty acid synthesis. So again, thinking about the reversal of this breakdown process. And then lastly, thinking about regulation. And if we have to move into a fifth lecture to talk about cholesterol metabolism, we'll do so. Okay, so big picture, you get ATP from the breakdown of fats when you take these long chains of um, essentially hydrocarbons, and we're going to snip them apart two carbons at a time, making acetyl-CoA, and then shortening our fatty acid by two carbons each time. So not only do we have acetyl-CoA molecules that can then go into the citric acid cycle, going through this process of what we call beta oxidation also generates FADH2 and NADH in two separate oxidation steps. Now you remember, we talked about when and where we see FADH2 before, that's when we do alkane to alkene oxidation. So we're gonna see that here, and then we see alcohol to um, uh, carbonyl oxidation when we have NADH. So again, we're going to see those two. We're going to review in our activity kind of the parallels that we had from the citric acid cycle for that, and then we'll see how that plays out here with fat metabolism. And then we'll do a little bit of bookkeeping, bookkeeping to realize how we have a much greater amount of energy that we get from fats. Um, you know, the magic number was 32 ATP from a glucose molecule when we have one 18 carbon fatty acid. Not a number you need to remember, but you can see it's substantially more, 106 ATP. So some things that we'll have to think about is imagine where these fatty acids were coming from. Remember those little black sticks in our uh, kind of process diagram. Once they get into cells, they are just in the cytosol of cells. So we actually need to think about getting them into the mitochondrion in order to do chemistry. And we kind of uh, handle that in two steps. The first thing is the carboxylic acid group is a very low energy kind of functional group. So we need to activate that. So we need to utilize a little bit of ATP and we activate our fatty acids by converting it into an acyl-CoA, or we call this a fatty acyl-CoA. So in having this thioester, now we're kind of activated to undergo this chemistry. The problem is, is we're still in the cytosol. Beta oxidation or fatty acid metabolism happens in the mitochondrion. There's no transport um, shuttles for uh, fatty acyl-CoAs, so we actually need to disguise this. And we call this putting on our carnitine hat. Remember, we talked about carnitine actually in um, a previous kind of workshop problem, but carnitine is going to be something that will have this fatty acyl-CoA, and then carnitine is going to be this molecule that we have here, and we actually will generate a um, uh, a carnitine ester here. So we'll actually kind of do this transesterification reaction here. And then we'll generate um, a species that with this carnitine hat, if you will, can pass through this carrier protein and get into the um, matrix of the mitochondrion. And then we release that carnitine hat and we have the fatty acyl-CoA on the inside of the mitochondrion. And then we're able to uh, have it undergo beta oxidation. So we'll spend most of our time in this lecture kind of talking about the chemistry of beta oxidation. What we'll see here, and this is kind of a, a picture I have from um, my chemical principles class. So it's a very simple picture, but I, uh, again, I like it because it highlights the steps. This is the picture from uh, your textbook, which kind of highlights the uh, biochemical processes and labels the enzymes. These enzymes aren't names that you need to know, but I do want you to know the processes. We basically have an alkane to alkene oxidation. So again, we're going to see that with a dehydrogenase enzyme that shuttles those electrons directly into the electron transport chain, just like we saw in the electron transport uh, chain with suck dehydrogenase being complex too. 
So now we have this trans alkene. We hydrate that and we generate an alcohol. So very similar to what we saw with um, chemistry in the citric acid cycle. So we'll draw a lot of parallels there as a way to review the citric acid cycle as well as learn this new chemistry. So hydration gives us this alcohol and then oxidation with NADH is going to give us our beta keto ester here. And then this is some chemistry we'll spend a little bit of time talking about. This beta keto um, acyl-CoA thiolase, or this enzyme here, um, allows us to do a reverse Claisen condensation. So the mechanism that we'll review is a Claisen condensation and then the reverse of it. So we'll think about how we can take beta keto esters, in this case beta keto thioesters, and the bond between that alpha and that beta carbon is what we call labile or easily broken. So we'll review that chemistry for how we think about doing uh, that process. So again, first step, we'll go through a lot of these in uh, our activities, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time right now. First step is oxidation, again taking this alkane and using FAD uh, and its reduction oxidizes that alkane to an alkene. Um, we'll talk a little bit about that correlation with um, sudden infant death syndrome or SIDS. So there's a correlation between the um, lack of activity of this enzyme in infants and a, p a potential kind of role in um, sudden infant death syndrome. Again, next step is um, this hydration chemistry. So we have this transalkene hydrated to an alcohol. Uh, again, we'll talk about kind of some mechanics, mechanistic homologs that we've seen for these different uh, enzymes. Third step, whoops, that is then oxidation. So again, taking this alcohol and oxidizing it to an, uh, a carbonyl here. Uh, that kind of chemistry will utilize NAD plus as its um, oxidizing species. Uh, and again, we'll see mechanistic homologs to chemistry that we saw in the citric acid cycle. So all things that we'll draw parallels to in our activity. We will spend a good bit of time on this fourth step here, this carbon-carbon bond cleavage. Kind of new chemistry that we haven't seen before. What we're going to do is review the mechanism for clays and condensation, and again, thinking about it in the reverse sense. So when we have these beta-keto carbonyl compounds, um, and in this case a beta keto thioester, this carbon-carbon bond right here is what we call labile, easily broken. So we'll talk about kind of this, this chemistry. We'll talk about it in terms of um, uh, chemistry here that we see with an ester, thinking about what if it was a thioester, so what we can see with um, acetyl-CoA. So we'll spend a good bit of time on that to think about this cleavage reaction. Uh, and again, we'll review things. We've actually seen a Claisen condensation um, in some other chemistries, and so we'll review that in our activity. Uh, we'll spend a little bit of time looking at the enzyme active site, just kind of detailing it like we know how to do, talking about different species acting as zero, as general acids, general bases, covalent catalysts, and so forth. So we'll review that. Uh, we'll spend a little bit of time just reminding ourselves what happens with each round of beta oxidation. And again, 14 ATPs coming from the acetyl-CoA, giving us 10 ATPs, and then each NADH and FADH2 contributing uh, a, a net of 4 ATPs. So we'll go through a little bit of um, bookkeeping, again, with a C16 fatty acid that's going to give us 106 ATP. Um, your book goes into a lot of detail on this. I'm going to have two slides. I want you to understand the concepts of it, not at all the details. So things that we have to think about, if we do this oxidation, hydration, oxidation, cleavage, that first oxidation generates an alkene. It generates a double bond. Well, what if you're metabolizing fatty acids that already have a double bond, like we see with unsaturated fatty acids, and unsaturated fatty acids having that cis configuration? Well, again, your book goes through a lot of detail of this. All that I want you to think about is two things are different. Those fatty acids come in with cis double bonds, our oxidation chemistry generates trans. And then regiochemistry is problematic. The double bonds that we see in naturally occurring fatty acids are never in conjugation. So if all of a sudden we're kind of chewing along on a fatty acid here and we'd be putting a double bond in such that it would be conjugated, it's problematic. We're not going to go through any of the details for what that means. Another thing that we will spend just a brief time um, mentioning is we've always kind of considered even chain fatty acids, so things that are based on a number of two. And when you take those and you divide those up into acetyl-CoA units with our two carbons, you're always going to have an even number. So when you have odd chain fatty acids, what that means is once you get down to that last piece, with ha which has 
three carbons, it can be problematic. And so we're going to have this propionyl CoA, a three carbon piece, and we'll have to deal with how do you metabolize that. So again, we'll go through some of the details of this in our um, activity. And your book goes into a lot of detail. You don't need to know more than these two slides. Okay. I'll mention just briefly our last B vitamin that we're going to talk about, which is vitamin D, uh, B12. This is also called cobalamin. So, and again, this is an, it's an essential mammalian vitamin. We get it from um, our diet. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about what it does, but it's very unique in that it's one of the only things in the human body that has a metal carbon bond. Uh, so just some interesting things that we'll think about with vitamin B12. Peroxisomes, just we'll talk about this as another oxidative organelle. A little bit of fatty acid oxidation occurs in the peroxisomes. Oftentimes it's finished in the mitochondria, but it might start in the peroxisome. So we'll kind of talk about that. And then we'll spend a good bit of time talking about acetyl-CoA. Again, the idea is hydrophobic fatty acids cannot pass uh, the uh, blood-brain barrier, and acetyl-CoA can't be transported out of the cell. So the liver couldn't help, for example, with the synthesis of acetyl-CoA and exporting acetyl-CoA directly um, to help with brain energy needs. However, what the liver can do is it can synthesize what we call ketone bodies. So ketone bodies includes things like acetoacetate, this uh, beta-hydroxybutyrate, which is just a reduced form of acetoacetate, and then acetone. So we'll talk about the chemistry for how these ketone bodies are made. Ketone bodies can be exported from the cells and they can be transported since they're very water soluble. So you can think about ketone bodies as being a water soluble fat breakdown product, if that makes sense. So the liver can metabolize fats, generate these ketone bodies, put them out into the bloodstream for other tissues to utilize. So we'll spend a little bit of time talking about ketone body synthesis. We're going to see a lot of chemistry that we've seen before. And then again, once you've made these ketone bodies, and they're taken up into cells, we need to actually remake them and do acetyl-CoA so that they can continue to be used as fuel in the citric acid cycle. So we'll go through a little bit of review for that. So that's it for our second lecture on fatty acid breakdown and the production of ketone bodies.